Hi, everyone. I am excited to present a very special guest on today's episode of Saka's Is That Show? Uh, is That So? We're already making mistakes and we haven't even started. I'm so nervous. No, I'm really excited. It's because I'm speaking to Ken Watson, who is the co-founder of Stock Perks, a really interesting fintech company. Um, and he was also uh, the former CTO of WeWork. Now, I'm not sure if anyone has seen that show on Apple TV, We Crashed, um, but uh, this is one of the main OGs as part of that. Anyway, long story short, excited to have you as part of the show, Ken. Welcome. Hey, Sakura, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Of course. So let's dive straight into the nuts and bolts of things. So you were obviously the CTO of WeWork and being a CTO at a non-traditional tech company must have come with its own set of problems, challenges, and all those types of things. Uh, just walk us through how you first got that opportunity and then kind of how you started to manage that role um, in, a, in a kind of non-traditional setting. So it was great. It's actually, it was one, uh, the story started one uh, cold February evening in New York City. A good friend of mine, from back from my Seattle days when I was back working at Microsoft, we hadn't seen each other for years. He said, we should go out for dinner. So we went out for dinner. He goes, listen, I'm, I'm working for this amazing company. He was an engineering fellow. Amazing company called WeWork. You should really check it out. Let, let, let me introduce you to some folks. And so by March, I had an interview. By April, I had started. And, uh, and it, was, uh, it was quite the roller coaster here that he, uh, he made it out to be. I actually started as the VP of engineering, um, look, looking after uh, a, a range of um, the, the tech stack that we focused on how we were put buildings together in the first place, how they brought buildings online and all the technology that went into the buildings. And then um, I, I uh, became CTO after, um, after Adam left the company and was part of the team that kind of got the ship back up uh, and sailing in the right direction. And so it was, uh, it was an incredible experience, but really started like many great opportunities with a friend introducing me to the idea and telling me how amazing uh, that uh, the company was. Absolutely. So what was the tech stack like when you first went into the company and kind of like what was your baseline for where you were and where you needed to get to? I mean, were there any software developers or people with tech skills there when you first got there? Was there infrastructure in place or were you kind of starting from scratch? No, we had. Uh, so, you know, we had hundreds of engineers in the company. In fact, we were, when, when I was hiring at the kind of the, at the peak of this rapid rise and hyper growth that the company was experiencing. We were hiring 100 engineers a month. And so we actually got very good at hiring talent. We adopted a lot of the, uh, the Amazon practices in terms of what they call bar raiser, where really the philosophy is that when you, you look to bring someone in, are they raising the talent bar in aggregate across the company um, as a way of really kind of holding ourselves to uh, ensuring that we weren't uh, being diluted in our efforts to kind of hire quickly. And it really held true. Listen, I think the most, the most, uh, as I look back upon the experiences, the number one thing that really kind of sticks to me is just how amazing the people were, and and what uh, what the main and what great culture and, and like extraordinarily strong culture can do to bring a company together and focus on you know achieving pretty amazing things in, in short periods of time. And you know a lot of that was down to the approach to hiring. Our approach to you know the, you know, engaging people, you know, mission and purpose. This is a and this is a concept that you know sometimes hear a lot about, but it really is is a lot about what was actually one of Adam's kind of enormous strengths is really building culture through mission and purpose and really giving folks a sense of belonging and understanding what their part was in you know bringing this initiative and this endeavor. Uh, to fruition and so um you know listen we, we, we hired like crazy we built that we built at the height i think technology had a 1600 people in um and it was a whole range of things there was a team that was just focused on real estate development so it was about you know we're stamping out 100 new buildings a year you know and it was ostensibly the same kind of thing each time right you had, a, you had the pantry the common area we could, you know the community bar you had the offices the corridors the you know, the storefront which is the glass and the aluminum framing uh, and yeah, you know, and all the you know, the wiring for the electrical and the Wi-Fi and, and the sensors we put in. How could we do that more efficiently than just by going out to a general contractor and getting it built? So we're thinking about you know what could we do? We were like investigating um, you know, three sixty degree cameras that you could walk around and with image processing look at the stat status of electrical work 
and see, you know, is that job being progressed? Is there a safety hazard there? You know, how could you, you know, get that building, you know, to complete quicker than just doing it the old way? And so this was kind of the approach we took to a lot of things, which was, you know, how could we be tech enabled? I mean, in the same way, you might not think a bookstore could be a tech company, but it's now most famously, you know, a tech company. There was a lot to thinking about how we could, you know, behind the scenes, how we could build uh, um, WeWork as an, an efficient enterprise that was able to do its core mission, uh, you know, super well because of all the you know, engineering investments we were making. Absolutely. So it sounds like you were building a tech stack almost for, for internal use to a certain extent, as opposed to selling it on to other B2B companies and things of that nature. Um, is that a fair assessment or statement or? Well, certainly it was, you know, the, the first, you know, first and best customer is the internal customer. You, know, you get a chance to build it, you get to work directly with stakeholders, you've got the problem right there. You know, I got my, uh, for example, I got my OSHA 10, so I, I know how to walk around a, a, you know, a building site with a, a spot all the safety hazards and things like that. So we did that, but really the goal, and actually some of that's come to fruition now with WeWork today, is that there was a lot of really interesting technology that was coming out of the company that could then be used to enable other companies to, to power flexible workspaces. Mm. And so, for example, you know, uh, flexible desk bookings and the approach to thinking about, um, uh, you know, occupancy, um, the, the way that you might, uh, you know, uh, an enterprise might want to pool all of its space, whether it's WeWork or not, but think of it like it's a, you know, a larger reservation system and provide, you know, mobile apps to their employees to be able to kind of, you know, come in and, and book space flexibly. All that stuff then becomes very interesting technology outside of WeWork as well. So I think that was always, always on the roadmap. Um, and actually, some of, as I said, some of it's popping out now in terms of offerings, tech offerings that WeWork has, has got in the market. Um, you know, back in the day when I started, we had, you know, in addition to the real estate development, we had a, a platform team that was just thinking about, you know, core. Uh, uh, you know, core platform objects that you might other teams would build upon, like how would you describe space and occupancy and authentication and, and that kind of connectivity and, and representation of our domain. And we had a team that was just focused on um, you know, the, uh, the, the the website and the, the booking system. You know, so how how do you take in uh, um, you know, make the, the booking experience delightful, whether it's on mobile or the web. And then there's a back end billing system. We took it upon ourselves back in the day. I and mean, this was kind of way back before I joined to build our own, you know, reservation and booking system. Um, and in many ways, you know, these were all, um, you know, well intentioned and, uh, you know, thoughtful decisions that were made based on what we saw was, you know, a very uh, unique use case that we had that really hadn't been. Uh, solved before. Now, at some point, you know, as we got bigger, we started thinking maybe there's some commodity systems that we could plug in and build on top of so we didn't have to build everything. Uh, but really, uh, there was a whole range of technology that was being built as, as the company was experiencing those hyper growth days. Fantastic. And did you actually need to hire 100 engineers per month to achieve your goals? Or was that kind of exuberance or someone else telling you you needed to, or did you actually really need that amount of talent to do all the many things you mentioned you were doing, the platform work, the modular work and all those things? Did, was the pace too quick in terms of, you know, scaling up the engineering team or do you think it was just about right? Well, you know, I guess with 2020 hindsight, it's, it's very <laughs> easy to, to poke holes in, <laughs> in any kind of game plan that didn't necessarily deliver the outcomes that folks were hoping for. Um, but uh, you know, I think given where we were and what we aspired to do at the time, and certainly the, there was no shortage of, you know, you know ideas and initiatives and thing, you know, problems that we could go and solve and, and, and drive more quickly, you know, there was, you know, we, kept, we kept that number of people busy. Now, the, I think one of the challenges, I mean, and we're not the first company to go through this, uh, but as you go through the hyper growth phase where things are moving very quickly, being able to stay on you know, this connection with the business, making sure you're delivering value, there's, there's good alignment, you kind of you know, see something through to the end and are you prioritizing, you know, that, as, as the old adage that uh, from resource constraints comes innovation. And we were in not a resource, the opposite of a resource constraint environment because we had access to a lot of it. And so as a result, I think naturally you found that there was 
uh, there, uh, there wasn't as many trade-offs being made as, as you would have were you in a more resource-constrained environment. And as a result, perhaps, you know, uh, you know come, what naturally comes with hypergrowth is you're not perhaps as sharp in terms of you know, being on point for what outcome you want to deliver. But having said that, you know, the ambition was so large, it almost didn't matter because we had a large surface area over which we could operate and tons of opportunity as you know, the company was literally doubling every metric um, every year. Um, and so that in many ways, part of the thinking was here, there was this uh, in the focus on trying to make sure we weren't going to get behind that and there was some way to skate, you know, skate towards the puck where the puck was going to be. And, uh, and so, you know, so I, there's no great answer to that. Obviously, we look back and you, you, can, uh, you can Monday night quarter, quarterback it if you want it. But uh, I, at the time, it seemed like there was just a ton of things we could be doing with the technology. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's so much happening. And I know that a lot of startups are trying to scale their engineering teams all the time. What were two or three things that you learned about scaling an engineering team that you've taken with you into your next company now, Stock Perks, which we'll get into a bit later on, but there's everything from recruiting to onboarding. I mean, there's scrum teams that need to be organized. There is, um, you know, JIRA tickets that people are creating. There's all sorts of processes. There's, there's a million things that, that happen, you know, to get productivity out of your engineers, especially as you scale. And sometimes too many cooks doesn't necessarily make the, the meal, you know, better. Sometimes it's better to have one engineer that's working on a project than seven. So anyway, long story short, what were some of the key things you learned about scaling engineering teams that you're going to take with you going forward? Listen, I think, I mean, and none of this is going to sound uh, like like a uh, rocket science. It's it's it is all kind of good hygiene, but we tend to forget it when things are when things are moving very quickly. But one of the things I always encourage my teams to do was, you know, and one of the things I always ask was we sit down, we sit down with the team, we talk about this, this new vision and this thing we're going to get done. It's like who who's your who on the business side, I like outside of technology. Mm. Is your partner in this in this endeavor? Who who also sees the world the way you see it? Who also sees the opportunity? And who's also aligned with you in terms of this being an effective way of delivering a you know a good outcome for the company? And I think there's a good amount of hygiene from that particular question because one of the challenges is that you, you can sometimes end up in a, in a um, you can end up in a in, in a world where you're magicking up requirements it's like oh this sounds like a good idea and you get a get enough people to get enthusiastic about something and suddenly it's you know this big thing and there's lots of resources being applied to it but you haven't given it that kind of a sanity check that are there other people who are who are uh, you know on the hook for you know dollars and cents for the company uh are also think that this is going to it's got legs and it's going to deliver the outcomes so i think that's a great place to start who's your partner in the business that 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 is going to stand you know who's going to co-present to me that this is the right thing for us to be doing. I think that that weeds out a whole bunch of things that we shouldn't be doing. Step one, I think, um, you know, hiring, just hiring as a machine. I know at some points we were spending, you know, you know, really talented and really, you know, productive people on the team were spending half of their week on hiring. Wow. And that's an incredible investment. And so what you need to do is get very programmatic about how it is you're going to approach hiring balancing some of that that load across the right folks one again one of the 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 um the the, um, the processes that came out of uh, you know a lot of folks come from amazon one of the things that really worked really well as part of the bar raiser process was this idea of um this kind of like a i think the term is, is the bar raiser the person who's not in the interview loop but is almost coaching the interview loop to make sure that everybody uh is is performing their role so for example um, they, they're the ones that, that uh, are asking all the hard questions about whether or not somebody really exhibited the, the, the behaviours and, the, and the, um, the experience that meets the requirements, you know, holds the hiring manager to account to be very crisp about the pre-game before going into the hiring loop in terms of what they're looking for, making sure that each of the folks on the hiring loop have, have got a specific domain, a set of questions that they're going to ask, making sure that the, the way that that is captured is is dispassionate. It's not it, and and part of that, and what we mean by that is that if you were to read the notes after the interview, uh, a second person would arrive at the same conclusion just by reading the notes. So it's not about uh, I got a good sense about Saki. He's a great guy. I think he's going to be a great fit for the team. Whatever that means, 
and um, you know he's, he's definitely you know senior engineer level. It's like well that that that's just my opinion. What you want to do is again make it dispassionate. I've got a bunch of questions I asked like this thing. Here's here's the example he gave. Here's the detail. Here's where I drilled in. Here's what the response was. Here's what was demonstrated. Here's where he was weak in the answer. Here's where he demonstrated a lot of depth in the answer, and, and he demonstrated depth because of the following things he shared. And then you can imagine someone reading those pretty extensive notes can read the transcript of the interview and hopefully then arrive at the same conclusion. And that's that kind of hygiene. It's a lot of work, a lot of work, but it's the stuff that stops you from um, making poor hiring decisions when you're operating at pace. So that's the second one. I think the third one is just, you know, the, uh, the idea of teams and teams kind of exist in all kind of elevations within an organization, right? So there's the scrum team, uh, or your, you know, the, the team that, you know, which is a combination of your engineers and the, and the product managers attached and the, and the designer and, and you know, the, the, the data scientist and that, that kind of that team and the things that you do as a team to allow them to develop culture and their norms. Um, and then there's the kind of the, the larger, you know, the larger group team. But then you, I always focus very heavily on my, my leadership team, you know, my direct reports as a, as a leader all need to feel like they're part of the team and we're all aligned on solving the same sets of, sets of goals and problems. Um, and as a result, I think we end up with a much more cohesive organization if your leadership team also feels very aligned and you know, talks the same talk and shoots for the same objectives and then that trickles through the organization in a way that keeps everyone aligned. I like to think of it a bit like, a, like we're a kind of there's this hill and there's this enormous boulder and somehow we've got to get it to the top of the hill. And if we've got good alignment, we're all on the bottom side of the boulder pushing it up. But if we're out of alignment, you've got people pushing from the side or on the top getting run over and the whole thing's a mess and it's not going to get up the hill. And so getting that organizational alignment is really important for, for effectiveness. Otherwise, you know, you see this a lot when people talk about these small, high-performing teams that get a lot of stuff done. It's just because there's a lot of alignment and you've, you've figured out communication and everybody knows where we're going. And you just got to, as you get, Big, and particularly as you get big fast, you've got to work extra hard to, to ensure that you're not just becoming very burdened by the, the magnitude of the organization, but rather you're taking that magnitude and maybe turning it into efficacy uh, so that you can deliver the outcomes that are going to be you know, ultimately going to help move the company forward. Absolutely. I love the first part you mentioned about having other stakeholders like a marketer or business person aligned to what you're doing in product. And when I worked in marketing, uh, that was probably our biggest frustration. We could spend millions of dollars on ads and get people to the top of the funnel. And then it's like, as soon as they got into the product, it was kind of, kind of this unknown land. We couldn't track where people were going, who exactly was converted. Do we know, you know, there, was it that customer that matched this ID that ended up doing things? So that whole journey was, I think, really important. And even more importantly, as you mentioned, commercial success as a marketer, are we going after the right customers because of this new feature or benefit that we've launched and all those types of things? So I couldn't agree more with you how pivotal product was in terms of making sure that what they're doing aligns with some of the other stakeholders. But there was something you mentioned as well that I want to kind of touch on. I, I recall a, a particular rule whereby uh, it states that the square root of the number of employees in a company end up doing like 80% of the work. So imagine there's 100 employees, apparently 80% of the work is done by 10, 10 of them. I can't remember what the name of the rule is, but do you, did you see that in your uh, practice and when you were working, or do you think that's not the case because you had such rigorous hiring standards and it wasn't just my feelings on this person, that kind of thing. You, you raised the bar for talent. But what's your kind of perspective on that? You know, I think that there's probably some other math equation here that's got something to do with you know talent plus culture divided by process, <laughs> something like that. So but I think but that's what it is, which is to say, I think you hire very talented people. We talked a lot about the recruitment process. Um, you, you overlay that with a strong culture. And I think what culture delivers, strong culture delivers, um, you know, the propensity for people to want to work together to very quickly orientate them around helping an, another team member you might not have worked with before, another part of the organization solve a problem, um, you know, to lend a hand uh, to, to, you know, for people to very quickly and nimbly buy into a change in direction. If we're going to say, hey, this is no longer the most important thing for the business, we want to we want to pivot to this thing, being able to do that at scale and have the organization move quickly with you. And I think these are all 
you know, outcomes of a very strong culture. And I think what strong culture buys you is the ability to be light and process. Um, and then if you're light on process, I think you reduce a lot of the headwinds you get, typically companies get when they become bureaucratic, that's kind of process heavy. And then so I think you then, and we ended up with, you know, an organization that was, you know, incredibly effective and, and you know, incredibly you know, moving forward super fast. Um, and, uh, you know, even though we were growing very quickly and, and there was, you know, every year there was twice the number of people there were the year before. Uh, so, yeah, I think, I think culture then helps us pull back on process, which, which in turn gets out of the way of, of people uh, you know, being successful and driving for outcomes at scale. Absolutely. So let's talk about that topic of culture. So it's no big secret, you know, the show We Crashed came out on Apple TV and all that, and they depict the culture as um, in a few ways. From my perspective, it seemed like it was very collaborative. Everyone was sort of bought into this amazing vision, but they also depicted it as somewhat chaotic and there were a million things happening. In fact, I think one episode, it was sort of uh, they invented we labs because they needed to have a tech valuation to get funding from like SoftBank and all those kinds of things. What would you describe the culture as while you were there? And do you think it's a fair representation of what the show kind of showed versus the reality? I didn't catch much of the show. Uh, although what, what I thought was the most unrealistic is that the, the, the uh, actors who played uh, Miguel and, and Adam were just, uh, which is too short. <laughs> Adam Miguel, like, they're just tall dudes. <laughs> presence as they came into the room. Um, so I, I can't talk to the show too much, but other than say, you know, sure there was chaos. I mean, you, inevitably there's going to be uh, a, you know, in a fast moving organization. Um, but I think this is what the culture did. You know, the alignment, Adam was, Adam was terrific at kind of, uh, at, at uh, sharing vision, getting people aligned, you know, talking about and having people follow through in this kind of collaborative uh, spirit that, uh, you know, everybody could talk to anybody. You know, I, I, right now I would, I would work without qualification. I mean, anybody who was there during my time and, and prior, we work. I just, I just know that it, it, it was a kind of a, a, a you know, a, a defining kind of period of time that, that uh, uh, there was a lot of pressure, a lot of stuff had to get done, but you just know that people work together super well it was like zero politics in the whole organization you know and then um and then uh, uh and, and it just led to you know just a great place to to get things done now is it obviously there was it's not without it's uh it went without its troubles and you know timing wasn't right for some things and you know the way we presented ourselves uh at, you know for for investment and stuff might might not have necessarily hit the mark clearly uh but in terms of culture it's just hard to and I don't think I've been in a company that has had um, that, particularly operating at that kind of pace, had that kind of depth of, of kind of connected tissue that came out as a result of the, the, the culture that was driven. And it's, it was, you know, it was just, just incredible. Really, really cool. Fantastic. And so I want to touch a bit on having a technical co-founder versus not. I don't know Adam that well but I don't imagine he was proficient in Python or Java or anything like that. Um, and then you get some startups that are founded by technical people, much like yourself, you're starting your own company from scratch as you know, CTO. What do you think are the fundamental strengths and weaknesses of having a visionary leader or founder that's very technical versus someone that perhaps isn't at all, but just has the maybe marketing or executional experience or all those other things? What's your perspective on that? So I think it's important. I mean, and, you know, Adam brought in uh, Sebastian Gunningham, um, who came out of Amazon, you know, completely uh, an amazing executive. And he, he brought a lot of that kind of technical, uh, you know, by, by the time we were ramping up technology, you know, obviously on day one of WeWork when it was just, uh, you know, Adam and Miguel and they were like uh, putting desks together and stuff, you know, but the technology wasn't nearly as, um, as critical as to the, it's, the part it played in helping the company scale and um, and achieve achieve the growth it did, and so um, you know by the time Sebastian came in, you know, I think he added all that that uh, you know technical co-founder um, you know expertise that you'd be looking for, and certainly he uh, he had a big impact on the organization in terms of the that tech culture that he brought. In. 
Absolutely. So I want to kind of pivot it into what you're doing now into the new stuff. But before we do that, what are some of the managerial leadership lessons that you kind of learned from that experience, which I'm sure you're very fortunate and lucky to have had because not many people can have that experience. Um, and so that's kind of like a mini crash course in learning how to, to you know, be in that kind of environment and, and be in a rapid pace environment as well. Um, but what are some of the two or three leadership management a humanistic lessons that you learned that you're taking with you into your next venture? I think, I think, uh, you know, I used to tell, tell my, my leadership team, even though there was T in my title for technology, um, you know, it was a, you know, it's a people first operation, right? You, you don't, unless you get the people stuff right, you're not going to get the te technology stuff right. And so through that, you know, at the heart of it, it's about kind of making sure that the mission and purpose of what people are doing is super clear and how the, you know, the things that, you know, a, a, an engineer rocks up or a designer rocks up to do on a particular day, it's super clear in their mind how things that they're working on connect to the, you know, success of the company and that it's clear, you know, and that they're bought into what we're trying to get done as, as a larger initiative. And so, so because of that, I think communication is super important. The other thing is you've got to, you know, communication, just as a tactical matter, uh, you know, I, I, often, I, I really tried to make sure that each you know, important communication uh, was done three times. And so we do a, do a town hall, we do something on Slack, I do like a bunch of team meetings. They're like, you've kind of got to bring the message in from different ways because while it's, you know, we've been thinking about it a long time, perhaps as the folks doing the communicating, you know, folks who are hearing it for the first time aren't necessarily, um, you know, they're hearing it for the first time. And, 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 and you know, I, I, actually, I, I tell, uh, this is part of my kind of bumper sticker management, you know, our job as communication, communicators is not just to throw the ball, but to make sure the ball gets caught, right? So it's, it's about making sure that the, the message is understood, not just that we deliver the message. And so I had a, a, a tech ops team uh, was just incredibly High, high performing and in, engaged and partnered with me very closely to make sure that in addition to us, um, you know, for all the uh, uh, you know, fast pace that we're working with, we always, always had to make sure that we were very good at change management, very good at communicating. And, and we put a lot of thought into making sure that that was crisp and we're on message. We gave, you know, leaders the materials to be able to go and present out to their teams, that rolled up to the, the larger message and so on. So very intentional communicating, I think was important in a fast paced environment. Otherwise, it's very easy to get lost. If things get, you know, if we're starting to pivot or things change or priorities get shifted, which, which are inevitable in a fast paced environment, um, you know, people can get left behind and they could be focusing on yesterday's priority, not on today's priority. And so you have to do, you have to be super good at making sure that that communicating was happening. So that was, you know, I think that for me, that was one of the big takeaways, um, just thinking it through that kind of human lens and making sure that, uh, uh, you know, folks felt connected and, and the communication channels were super clear so that uh, as we navigated the path, um, we made it happen. I guess the other thing I, uh, it was, I think it was, became super clear as well is that, you know, there's no point in hiring an organization full of super talented people if you then operate in a kind of command and control structure, you know, I, I can't, as the leader of an organization, I can't be the one to have all the good ideas. Well, I kind of like my ideas, and I, I have lots of them, but I'm, 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 I have enough humility to know that perhaps mine aren't all, always the right ideas. And so, um, and so what's more important, I think, is my job as the leader, I, I think about you know, climbing a hill or a mountain kind of metaphor. My job is to make sure that I'm, I'm planting a flag on the top of the mountain, be super clear about where we're going. And then, um, then, so that's you know, vision. And then strategy, perhaps I'll work with my leadership team or they'll work with their teams and together we'll figure out how we're gonna get there and what path we're gonna take up the hill. So what's the right way to achieve those outcomes. And then, um, and then, and then it's all about the focus. The, the day, every day we're gonna go into the trenches and we're, we're making steps. Everyone needs to feel equipped and empowered to kind of like navigate over a log or around a hole or don't fall off the side of the cliff, right? We've got everyone's got a part to play in getting us to the top of the hill. Um, and if we have the kind of the, the, you know, the vision strategy and the focus all in harmony and all lined up, we're likely to all get there uh, in one piece and, and get there as quick as we can. And so for me, that was, as we think about communication, it's also about uh, making sure that it's, uh, it's presented the right way. And you're also taking advantage of the fact you've got 
hundreds of super talented people in the organization who can bring something to helping us move forward. And, and, we, and uh, if you set yourself up in the right way, set your organization up in the right way, you're going to end up being much more effective as an organization than if you uh, just try to do everything through the, the lens of this is what I want to have done today. Absolutely. Well, hopefully you haven't copyrighted or trademarked that analogy about throwing the ball and catching it, because I'm going to steal that one. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've got a bunch of them. I should do a coffee book. I got a bumper sticker management. Just little, <laughs> little quips you have that uh, they kind of describe a concept in, in uh, how we should operate. But anyway, yes, it's all yours. So okay, it's, uh, it's for me to do. Fantastic. And uh, so, I mean, we've spoken about the past a lot and about the pivot that you mentioned. Uh, and so, I'd like to move into the future. You're working on something super exciting. You kind of pivoted into fintech, and this is a very big departure from where you were before. So, kind of walk me through where you got to now, and kind of where the idea for Stock Perks came, and how you manage that pivot, not just in your career, but even just in your daily lifestyle, in terms of the problem you were solving, in terms of the way you operated as a startup versus a big company. Just walk us through that change, how you got into what you're doing now. It's interesting, my career has kind of gone, some folks have a career that's very kind of linear. It's like I had a, you know, I had a team of 200, my next job needs to be, you know, a team of 400. And I have, you know, it kind of, everything needs to go up. And that's, you know, that, that works well for some folks. Um, and, I, and I see the, uh, the attraction of it. Um, but I've done kind of the, the big to small, the big to medium, the big to small kind of career growth. So, you know, I started off, um, you know, way back, you know, with what was then Pricewaterhouse and consulting. And so it was like an enormously large professional services organization, although I was in Perth in Western Australia. So I was like a tiny little subsidiary. Um, and uh, so we had to come small and the big thing kind of all happening at once. And then joined Microsoft, where I'm in Australia again. Um, and, uh, you know, and then I went from Microsoft in Sydney to London to Redmond. And so I kind of got a flavor for being in the in a small subsidiary to a large subsidiary to the headquarters and actually ship, shipping software. And actually both my, uh, both my sisters are oil and gas engineers and they, they call that proper engineering because I, <laughs> I think they get dirty when they go on oil sites. <laughs> but, uh, but when I got to Microsoft, so I was the release manager for the Visual Studio platform. And so in, in DevDiv, we had 1,500 engineers and the engineering that goes into delivering a product in a predictable period, predictable period of time, at a predictable level of quality with a predictable set of features is all about engineering, that kind of predictability and, and kind of wrestling the, 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 the release out the door is actually a really kind of fascinating uh, um, education in terms of how software engineering works at scale. Um, but anyway, so but after leaving Microsoft, actually one of my first startups was, which was with, uh, which was in the fintech space. It was for investor relations that focused on institutional investors. Mm -hmm. And what we're doing now in Stockbooks is for investor relations focused on retail investors, which is very topical given the, the shift in the market over the last few years. And so, you know, in between there, I was also the CTO for a, a big fintech called iPrio out of New York, which got bought by IHS Market, which then just got acquired by S&P Global. And so, so I've actually been in and out of fintech for a long time. So this, that in itself was a, a big departure. I think coming back to um, uh, coming back to stock perks was uh, was really just a recognition and and that the, the market has changed. So what we're doing at stock perks, real quick, is that we're helping connect um, publicly traded companies with their retail investors. Now today, uh, over you know about a third of the outstanding shares in the U.S. capital markets are in the hands of direct retail investors, individual investors like you and me. But companies don't have any relationship or any connection uh, with those uh, with those uh, investors. Or if they do, it's it's sporadic, or it's at the annual meeting, or it's on an earnings call. But it's there's no ongoing year round relationship where you know there's a two way kind of communication going on. And so the idea of stock perks was actually built upon a couple of ideas. One is that this idea of um, uh, receiving a perk for holding stock has been around for a long time, long time in the US, um, long time in Japan, where it's like famously uh, popular, almost 2000 companies offer perks to their shareholders um, just for, for being a shareholder in the company. Um, in the US, it's been in here for a couple of decades. If you are an owner in a Ford motor vehicle company, you can get uh, uh, almost employee discount on a new car just for holding hundred shares. So the idea has been around for a little while, but really what we're using is that idea, plus this demand for companies to be able to engage their retail investors 
and we're creating this engagement platform. So for companies, it's about year round retail investor engagement. For the individual investor, it's about getting free stuff for holding stock. And so that's the that, that's kind of the premise of Stockbooks. And we're creating this, this community of um, individual investors and this, uh, this array and this portfolio of companies offering perks. And what sits in the middle is Stockbooks, which is this uh, uh, allows, for example, the CEO of a company to do a very specific retail investor video. Um, you can maybe get discounts off their products, hear from them throughout the year, maybe vote at their proxy, um, their, their proxy vote at the end of the year. And, and it really just brings everyone together. I think what's fascinating about it is there's this new generation of investors that are, are growing up in a, in a world where there's zero commission trading, but you're also, you invest in the brands you know and love. And, you know, people are expecting a level of connection and transparency and authenticity from the institutions in which they engage with. And the current setup really kind of disintermediates the retail investor from the issuing, uh, the issuer, because you've got the broker in between, you've got, you know, uh, the proxy tabulators in between. And as a result, you know, we don't have that connection. So Stockbooks is about bringing those two parties together and, um, you know, uh, uh, delivering those who get that engagement year round. Fantastic. I think it's a great idea. I might even go buy one share of Tesla in hopes that I can get an employee discount as well. Uh, I'd We're working on Tesla. We're working on Tesla. <laughs> if you buy a share in WeWork and get three free days in WeWork, um, that's a uh, really? stock purchase platform. Or if, uh, if you're uh, a Vista Outdoors, which does the Camelback uh, backpacks and the Jira ski goggles and so on, you can get, you can get discounts off their products for being a shareholder in Vista. And, and, and so on. So go ahead, yeah, definitely. Uh, listeners, uh, check, check out Stock Perks in the, uh, in the App Store and check out the perks we've got on offer and there's new perks coming every week. Fantastic. And the app is live right now. People can sign up and download it and all that? Yep, we're, we're in, the, in the App Stores. Um, download, uh, download it today. And as I say, we're bringing on new perks all the time. Uh, we've got uh, you know, about 20 or so companies represented on the platform today, and we're out talking with companies. And I've got actually an array of really fun companies coming up uh, on online with us over the summer. And so I'm really excited to be able to share that with our, our community. Fantastic. I can just think about five to 10 years down the road, I can imagine people wanting to purchase Disney stock and then getting a ticket to go to Disneyland or for their kids or something like that. So this is a whole new category almost. You know, it's, it's fascinating. Back in the, you know, there's this pendulum that swung because like back in the 80s, your grandparents would give you a, you know, a framed Disney, you know, 10 shares in Disney stock. Yeah. Yeah certificate you put up on your wall and you hold it and you felt this connection to the company and then we went through the kind of the period of all the etfs and this was you know people weren't were you know feeling that connected and we swung all the way back and i think that pendulum is swinging back really fast when people are looking for that engagement and want to hear from the companies um you know disney in fact used to offer shareholder benefits and uh, they're definitely on our list to target to talk about what we can do to help them get back uh, get those uh, perks back online for their shareholders Fantastic. So for any listeners out there, if you happen to know an exec at Disney, reach out to Ken Watson and let's make this connection, right? <laughs> Definitely perks involved in the, in the referrals. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thanks so much, Ken. Um, how can people reach out to you or uh, is there any call to action for our audience, whether to follow your LinkedIn page, apart from downloading the app, obviously, but what, what's kind of the, uh, the best place to interact okay. with you or stock perks? Sure. Uh, check us out on Instagram or TikTok. Um, you can uh, go down, most definitely download the app, check out the perks. And if you want to uh, find me, you can find me on, uh, on LinkedIn or just Ken at stockperks.com. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Ken. All right, Sucker. Great. Thanks so much. Cheers.